So today, it's my pleasure to welcome a distinguished guest. Uh, we have with us today, Lee Coulter. Lee, how are you today? Fantastic. It's a Friday, Pascal. <laughs> Excellent. We are, we are super happy, honored to have you with us today. Lee, over the coming seconds, I'll try to introduce you. Okay, it's a, it's a very complex exercise given the, the richness of your your professional life and career over, over, the, over the last years. So, first of all, um, in my view, huh, for me, you're the godfather of cognitive and intelligent automation. Um, and, uh, you're the, the chair of the IEEE standards on intelligent automation. So, IEEE being the, the organization in charge of setting the global business and technology standards. Uh, and, and in this context, the has set the first definitions and frameworks of cognitive automation. And I think it was in 2016, 17. Uh, uh, can, you, can you remind me when was yeah, it? Yeah, we started in 2015 and uh, our first standard was published in 2017. Uh, then we released one in 2019, and uh, our third uh, standard uh, implementation and management methodologies was actually published on Tuesday. Uh, so IEEE 2755.2-2020, uh, we'll find that standard. We're pretty excited about it. We'll be doing some PR on that uh, here over the next month. Excellent. So very, very excited to have you with us today. Uh, to give a bit of background on yourself, you're a 30 plus years executive, okay? Uh, your career is just amazing. You've held uh, leadership positions in prestigious companies such as uh, General Electric, Aeon, Kraft Foods, uh, and more recently, Ascension, Transform AI. Um, I, I mean, really a challenge to, to summarize such a, a rich career in, in a few seconds. Um, but here, here is a tentative. You, you started at GE for 15 years, where you held multiple leadership positions uh, in the healthcare, capital business divisions, uh, in, and in the IT business uh, outsourcing. Uh, after that, you moved to Kraft Food as a chief administrative officer, where you led the, the global implementation of more than 100 shared service centers uh, in more than, than nine functions across the world. After that, you joined, you joined Aeon Corporation, where you, you led the global IT transformation. You then moved and, and, and founded and led Ascensions, which is a, which is a globally recognized captive uh, business process outsourcing. Um, and a few weeks ago, you just completed the sale of Transform AI, uh, basically a hyper-growth automation business that you built and led over the last two years. Nice. Uh, so congratulations for that. <laughs> Again. Thank you. Thank you. So on top of this, uh, you've published more than 100 papers. You, 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 I mean, we've seen you in many podcasts, a thought leader, uh, a recognized thought leader on the, on the topic. Um, so very proud of us today. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, um, very, very uh, kind. And I'm really excited to be here with you, Pascal. Thank you. So... Without waiting further, let's start with the first question. Um, so I've, I've heard you speaking about Industry 5.0. Um, what is the difference between Industry 5.0 and 4.0? Uh, can you tell us more about that? Sure. It's a really important topic. And um, some of the best thinking around this uh, actually comes out of Singularity University, and I'm a member of Abundance 360, which is uh, related to that. And so this notion of Industry 4.0 and 5.0 are based on uh, the, the key differentiator, uh, differentiator is convergence. So what does that mean? So the power of telecommunications, of 5G by itself, so we'll take 5G as one thing. And it has, it has an innovation curve and its advancement is, is uh, in, in terms of its speed and latency and bandwidth um, is, is A. Um, and then separately, so we'll put that aside, we'll just say that's 5G. And then separately over here we have IoT. 
So IoT is a whole field of, of sensors and monitors and, and data. So this likewise um, is on an exponential curve, um, the world of IoT devices. Uh, and then maybe I'll put um, cloud and big data as another area of innovation, which is moving on its own innovation trajectory. So each of these, as you look at them, we could say those are those, that's an industry 4.0 um, thing. We're seeing rapid disruption. Um, we're seeing uh, in, you know incredibly exponential growth in in the innovation in the area. Now, when you contemplate the combination of these things, it's like one one plus one plus one is 75. Um, and that's really industry 5.0. So what does that mean? So if I just take 5G and IoT um, just by themselves and I apply that to agriculture, we now have fully automated farms that nobody ever visits. The equipment maintains itself. Every plant gets watered um, and fertilized specific to its needs. The weeds are, are you know, they're, they're burned out with lasers by robots that go over by. And this is not, you know, drones monitor the health of every single plant on the farm. This is not like uh, science fiction. This is the real power of convergence when these uh, these different technological areas now come together and they themselves, each one of them on an exponential path has exponential to a power um, when you put them together and, and you look at the power of, of these things uh, together. Uh, and there's, there's a host of examples of, of different places that individually we're seeing uh, exponential innovation um, we would just call in isolation 4.0. Um, but what's really happening so fast around us right now is the convergence. And I'll use a quick example for that. So there was an X Prize about, uh, oh, it wasn't long ago, maybe less than a year ago. Um, and it wasn't a big one. I think it was $500,000. And it was to the team, the first team that built a working tricorder you know, from Star Trek. <laughs> and uh, it had to it had to perform I, I want to say twelve or thirteen vital functions, um, and the the X Prize was won in like six weeks. And this team I want to say it was uh, it was somewhere in Asia. I want to say it was in Japan. Um, they basically pulling all off the shelf technologies assembled a tricorder built around, you know, a, a smartphone and, and they won this thing in, in a month and a half, you know, they just they expected, you know, it was going to run its full three year course. And, um, no, because in sensors and in telecommunications and data and everything that they needed in order to create this tricorder, um, all of, all of those technologies were, were moving uh, very, very fast in their own respect. And when you put them together, that tricorder is, is uh, you know, that's really a, an industry 5.0 uh, sort of dynamic. So did that make any sense, Pascal? I know it was a lot of words. No, no, it's, it's very clear. So it's about the convergence of technologies that are currently existing. Uh, and this convergence creates synergies. Um, and, and the first question that comes to my mind is what is preventing us to get there right now? Well, interestingly, um, standards are one of the big challenges. And we'll just talk about uh, IoT, telecom, and, and big data. Um, we don't have globally accepted standards on how IoT data shall be gathered, captured, and stored. So... If we had, and, and you know I'm a fan of standards, because standards allow the industry to innovate much, much more rapidly. And I ask this question all the time. Would you personally go purchase a router, an internet route, a Wi-Fi router, that didn't say 802.11 dot something, right? 
No, of course not, because that's the standard. And every USB stick you put in your computer, it fits, and it, it follows USB 3.0, 4.0, 5.0. Um, and this really allows for dramatic uh, you know, impact to uh, uh, the standards speed up innovation and our ability to collaborate and co-innovate together, which I think is really important. So if we look... If we look for evidence of, of Industry 5.0, we see its nascent, its beginnings. Um, you know, I, I follow with, with great interest uh, full self-driving, uh, or we'll just call it, you know, level one through level five autonomy in vehicles. And I'll, I'll be more vague about that because most people don't realize that most of the cargo ships today, um, except for the time spent in port, it's fully autonomous. Uh, aircraft, except for the time leaving and arriving, it's fully autonomous. People don't really realize the level of autonomy in other vehicular situations we have. But each of those is, a, is an example of this convergence of many different kinds of technologies that make um, this sort of capability possible. So as we look out at the things that are um, emerging today or that have emerged in the last two to ten years uh, a lot of them wouldn't be possible if some of these individual technologies had not all mo been moving through you know just exponential um, uh, innovation uh, and and change I, I even look Pascal at intelligent automation mm -hmm. and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in some significant aspect but here's a great example of the convergence that has occurred in just the last 12 to 24 months um, is completely changing the landscape of what IA is, how it's put to good use, um, how it's consumed, um, etc. So, well, I'm sure we'll uh, do a little bit more there. Very good, very good, very good. Very good insight on, on that. And the question that comes to my mind is, so when, when, when will Industry 5.0 come? Is it, is it, and, and I remember we've seen uh, Industry 4.0 um, uh, uh, kicked off by, by the book by uh, Klaus Schwab. Uh, it was maybe in 2017, 18, something like that. So it's like, uh, yeah, four or five years ago. Um, yeah. Do you think those cycles will, will become shorter and shorter in the future? Yeah, they, they absolutely they are. I mean, if you look at industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, um, they have relatively long periods of time. And believe it or not, industry 1.0 in, involved agriculture. And this was probably the most fundamental innovation in the history of humanity for the one very specific reason that it enabled specialization in cultures, in groups, in cities, in villages, whatever whatever unit you want to talk about, before everyone participated in subsistence um, uh, nutrition, right? What they gathered and killed that day, they ate. And once agriculture was around, now all of a sudden you can have a blacksmith and you can have a furrier and you can have an animal husbandry person. and. And, and you can have these people who specialize. And if you look at the whole rest of evolution, um, irrigation and, and uh, uh, agriculture are, are the foundational Industry 1.0 uh, innovations. You could argue fire um, also uh, among them. So some of these cycles we could say are 15 to 50,000 years. Uh, if you get to industry 3.0 and 4.0, we're talking 70, 70 to 90 years. Um, uh, industry 4.0, probably more like 50 years. And then, uh, you know, here we are looking at 5.0. And I've made this statement before that only by somebody sitting in the future and, and looking at the data, doing analysis, will be able to say, here's more or less when we started um, this Industry 5.0 thing. Because really, in my mind, um, I most people don't realize that tablets have been, they were debuted to the world in July of 2010. 
And tablets really are uh, an example of Industry 5.0. Uh, you know, chip fabrication and telecommunications and display technology and battery technology. All of these individual technologies had to converge in order for us to get a tablet. And then you have software innovation like uh, an application platform and so on and so forth and standards uh, for them to work within. Um, so there are pieces of evidence of 5.0 pretty much wherever you look. The question is always about adoption, the speed of adoption. And of course, we know from the adoption curve, right? We have the innovators, the early majority, late majority, the laggards, um, and, and different groups will, will adopt in, in different periods of time. What we've seen very recently here though, in fact, you and I are part of it right now. We're doing this fireside chat using remote technology. Well, there's a billion five to a billion seven human beings that 13 months ago could not have imagined performing their job remotely. And the pandemic forced radical adoption rates. Well, what does that do? Well, now everybody has this base level of capability in their home, their kitchen, their library, their basement, wherever. Um, and what that will allow for in terms of the further separation between workplace and workspace, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and, and I'm happy to, to diverge there, but that's another case of, of where when we see the pace of things, adoption is usually the, the, the it's the long uh, pole in the tent. It is the thing that, 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 uh, keep, that slows the whole process of innovation down. Do you think the, the to ju just in uh, to transition into into the um, more into the topic of work in workplace? Do you think the current pandemic and and the context in which we are has has kind of uh, uh, accelerated this transformation and bringing us closer to to industry for five point zero, yeah. uh, especially in the work in the workplace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the acceleration, and if you look at the flow of VC dollars and, uh, uh, and, and PE dollars into, uh, and I'm going to use a word that Cisco used to use for a product, but I'm going to use it as, as um, a general term, which is telepresence. And for everybody that's listening, I would encourage you to go to NA, that's the All Nippon Airways X Prize. Um, here we are in April. Finalists should have been announced. I didn't look to see who the announcements were, but if you look at the X Prize, here's an airline who who stood up an X Prize telepresence. And here's my layman's way to describe that telepresence. And remotely project your entire awareness into something equivalent to one of the Boston Dynamics uh, robots, right? So this gives you full interactivity, um, visually, auditorily, uh, your ability to interact with physical things there. Um, and this is a, a really great example of what ANA was going for. They realized that the airline industry, it's going to die. It will always, it will always, there will always be some amount of actual physical travel, um, but for a great uh, part of the need to collaborate and to work together, we have been, we've been prying apart the, uh, the workplace and workspace, um, probably since telephony was in, in, in really introduced into the workplace. So probably back in the fifties and sixties when two people could, could collaborate together over a t at least a telephone connection, right? Um, that was probably the, the first separation of, 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 of the workplace and workspace. And of course now um, we have uh, virtual reality, mixed reality. Um, and I don't know if you've had a chance, Pascal, to, to try the Magic Leap or the HoloLens. Um, I have had the good fortune to try these technologies and they, 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 they made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, uh, particularly the Magic Leap 
uh, technology did. And the level of reality for the interaction with that projected presence was so uncannily real um, that you can see and just, you know, some of this stuff's available now, um, right? So there's, uh, for those of us who come out of the shared services world, you know, they have the, the robot, which has, you know, with wheels and a screen on a stick and somebody can literally drive it around and into a conference room and be participating in meetings. Um, that's early 5.0 in the telepresence stuff. Now you can imagine a, a full-blown avatar, um, and, and I, I, I need to attend a meeting in, in Tokyo, and so I simply rent time on an avatar there and uh, you know, connect my rig in my home office and fully project myself uh, into, uh, into that area. I was, I was blown away, Pascal, um, home advisor, which, you know, is a website for people who need help with home repairs and, uh, upgrades and, you know, remodeling. They now have a section on, on home telepresence and home VR rooms. They have a whole section, and this is kind of a, it's a light bulb for me that says, this is hitting so mainstream mm -hmm. that something as mundane, you know, where you go to look for a, a good plumber or electrician, is now offering advisory services to set up your VR room. You know, how to be safe, you know, where to put the harnesses, the hooks in the ceiling, how many cameras do you need in your room? What does the lighting need to be? What does the color need to be? Um, you know, what is the, the total dimension need to be? And how do you overlay um, with a projector the boundaries of whatever current virtual environment that you're in and so on and so forth. Um, these it's crazy that we see this. I agree, I agree with you. We see, we see this more and more in the, in the shops. And as you say, it's a signal that, that it's something is coming. Yeah. But, but we don't see yet a large, a large adoption. Uh, and maybe, maybe the price point is, a, is an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the mentalities. I don't know what's your view on that. Well, do you remember, uh, and I'm going to say this is just five, seven years ago. So Cisco had a product called Telepresence and it was super high quality um, uh, audio and video collaboration for companies. And each room yeah. cost about 250,000 US dollars <laughs> to install. I remember that. Now, you and I can do this with our phones at any point in time. We can just flip to video if we wanna add more people we just start calling more people and add them into a video call. So already we've seen this dedicated technology that was the Cisco telepresence rooms be made democratized, demonetized, and available now to pretty much anybody who has bandwidth and a reasonable device. Um, and I think we'll start to see that same sort of, of evolution. I've seen some of the new display technologies. They're going with 3D display technologies, holographic display technologies. You add to that um, the virtual environments that are built. There's a, there's a real estate company. Um, their name will come to me in just a second. Um, but they exist entirely virtually. Um, they do their office is a virtual environment and they all put on their VR rigs when they have team meetings. Right? They, they currently hold the record for the most concurrent sessions in a VR environment. I think they had uh, almost 800 people in a single VR environment. Um, and every all of their interactions with their customers are in a virtual environment. Um, as you can imagine, there it's property, um, yes. so perfectly adaptable to high levels of, of 2D and 3D um, uh, representations in a virtual space. But this yes. is just an example. Yeah, virtual, uh, virtual viewings and so on. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, it, go ahead. so I, I see, I see, I see a big impact of this in, as you just mentioned, in commercial activities, sales activities. Uh, and collaboration uh, in, in general in the, in the workplace. Um, do you see an impact of this in the productivity, you know, in uh, what's your sweet spot on huh? the operations, the, the back office or IT or? Yeah, for sure. 
Um, and when I was at Ascension, I had uh, a skunk works, and uh, we, we were doing all sorts of, of interesting uh, experiments around workspace and workplace, and the ability to augment an individual person's productivity. So, um, as an example, how accurate are retinal trackers? Well, it turns out that retinal trackers are really, really accurate to about uh, 0.6 millimeters at four feet. Um, so you can actually tell if somebody's looking at the screen, you can actually tell what part of the screen that they're looking at, what are they reading, and why is it relevant to the piece of work that they're doing. Okay. Um, so when I talk about, when I think about... Like, it can be like glasses as well, huh? Yes, like, absolutely. Um, I mean, you, we are still on the same computer, but yeah. Yep. Or actually, you, you you don't need anything. So we were looking at you know little little pin cameras um, arranged in a in a grid versus the glasses that have uh, inward facing cameras. But here's a case where miniaturization and battery and telecommunications and bandwidth and all these things have converged to make it possible for you to put on a pair of glasses and I can know exactly what you are reading on the screen. That is 5.0 delivered as a microservice in this world of automation. Um, and you know, our, world of, our world of automation, um, I think, continues to grow and expand as well, Pascal. So of course, most of our automation work for, for human history um, until about 30 years ago, 50 years ago, was all around physical automation, automation of, of physical activities. And so now we're, those capabilities are being converged with advanced technology, information related technologies um, that are changing those worlds. And I just, uh, I referenced the farm, right? It's managed by six people who never actually visit the farm. Uh, everything that they do is is through a keyboard. A hundred thousand acre farm run by six people who never actually go to the farm. It's it's a remarkable, it's a great case study out there on that. Um, and so as we look at the the office um, or the productivity of large enterprises, these technologies are. We went through a radical acceleration of, of adoption, which provides a foundation now for um, the introduction right on the heels of this uh, additional disruptive uh, technologies. Uh, and I, and I, I don't know, I'll, I'll just stop there. There's a hundred places I could go with, with that line of thinking um, that all of us <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, Lee, I think, I think, you, I think you should write a book on that. There is, a, there, you, there is so much insight in what you say. Uh, yeah, the workplace of the future, and, and um, so what surprises me is from the beginning of our conversation, we haven't talked about uh, intelli about artificial intelligence, about machine learning. So that's that makes me think that it's a given. It's a, it's it became like as as as. Um, as Google CEO said, uh, like fire or, or, right. or electricity, it's a basic. It's a it's a it's a given point. Now we are building on top of it. Yes, it's uh, amazing. It's uh, so one of the most. Uh, if you look at fundamental innovation throughout the uh, eons of human existence, uh, a few stand out. Uh, we mentioned a couple, right? Irrigation, fire, plastic. The discovery of plastic was was has changed the world. Right, um, in so many different ways, um, the invention of refrigeration, um, the invention of obviously a transistor, and so on. These are these are kind of fundamental innovations that uh, you know have, have fueled humanity over time. And if you look at the starting points for when each of those things happen, and you 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 overlay your exponential graph. It gives you a good indication of why we are seeing so many things moving at at, uh, at at just ridiculous, right? Four times the capability at half the cost every eighteen months. I mean, this is um, this is happening in in real life, real time for us right now uh, because so many things are are moving so fast. And if I look at 
this separation of workplace and workspace, it introduces for enterprises a whole new set of questions. How should I structure workflow and work uh, space and workplace? Um, and and you mentioned uh, AI, and you and I have had this conversation. I, I, I try to stay away from that term because it's so ill-defined. Yes. Um, I prefer augmented intelligence or machine learning. Um, the singularity, the point at which, uh, you know, the experts judge that we will have machines that demonstrate uh, true intelligence is somewhere between eight and and 13 years from now, right? So it depends on who you like, uh, somewhere in the late 2020s to mid 2030s, that this is going to happen. This is not a question of, oh my gosh, I wonder if it will, I hope it will. Yes. It's guaranteed, it's coming, right? Um, and and so data is uh, data and data management are in this world. When you look at it in isolation, something like Cloudera uh, is 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 fantastic on its own. Now bring cloud and containerization and microservices and and AI um, to the game. And what's possible in terms of how we reimagine um, the work that we do <clears throat> in in our enterprises? There's something called zero-based design, which is uh, one of the big consulting businesses likes that term. Yes, um, and it really just means clean sheet of paper. It, I mean. <laughs> Um, it's kind of a fancy, you know, thousand dollar an hour consultant speak for if you were going to build it today, how would you build it regardless of the constraints of your current reality, right? If, if you had a fresh clean sheet of paper, how, how would you build it? And this is where things like rocket mortgage come from, right? Uh, you know, rocket mortgage is... Um, consistently give, concluding mortgages in 24 hours or less. You know, something that has for the entire prior time on earth been a six plus week process, right? So uh, when you now bring clean sheet of paper thinking in and you have industry 5.0 converged technology capabilities together, then our ability to reimagine what portion of the work should be performed by who or what, uh, when and, and does when and where matter, um, and what technology tools can I bring to bear to improve the experience of the people involved with it, those performing the tasks and those experiencing the service or the, the, the work being done, um, the accuracy and consistency, speed throughput, you know, all of these things that when we think about large enterprises, you know, these are really, these are big topics we wrestle with. You know, big companies have big stuff, right? You have 50,000 vendors um, and you have 3,000 offices and you have a quarter of a million people. These are big numbers and there's a lot of work that goes on. It's, it's open for transformation. And uh, what has happened to, and I'm going to use another term and you and I, we've talked about this as well, RPA, which I worked really, really hard to get that redefined uh, differently. Um, but RPA, when it began, was a specific tool, and it had a set of use cases that were specifically tied to RPA. And then there was RDA, and they had a set of use cases. What's happened? Automation, robotic process automation. Just to make it, yeah. Uh, robot, RPA for robotic process automation, RDA yeah. for robotic desktop automation, which is UI-based automation. Yes, uh, human in the loop. Uh, uh, interactive automation, uh, RDA. Yeah, sorry, I, I was just assuming everybody had that basic. Uh, um, so that shifted materially in the last 
18 to 24 months. So uh, the, the conversation about, oh, are you doing RPA? Are you doing RDA? Are you even, are you doing intelligent automation? Those were questions about a very, what was thought of as a very specific thing that you're a specific family of technologies that does a very specific thing. And what's happened is we're now bringing that set of tools to the workbench as we reimagine work. And it's now being combined with very sophisticated, um, I'm going to use a term, but AI tools that can be now purchased as a microservice for 10 thousandths of a penny um, via uh, the cloud. And I, and I always use the example of OCR because OCR is an incredibly complicated thing and it requires a ton of, of computing power and so because on. Because OCR for optical characteristics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, yes. and, and, and now, you know, for uh, pennies, fractions, tiny fractions of a penny per word, you can rent these services. I mean, I was looking at, uh, we were doing some videos like this and in one hour you can upload we could upload this video and have both closed caption, right? We, we could have everything that we said under our names yes. uh, with 100% accuracy and return to us in, in an hour. Uh, and we would pay about 10 bucks, uh, you know, per yes. minute. This is a, an example of, of just how dramatically different our workplace can be. Uh, if you've run in a global organization and you need to communicate across borders, uh, across languages and cultures, you could imagine having a near real-time service, which you may, maybe you record a, a meeting, an important meeting, and then uh, within an hour you've had it uh, subtitled and translated into the seven languages you need and distributed to the teams that need to, to interact with it. Um, all, all within a, in a couple of hours. And it, it changes, it just changes the nature of the work that uh, we should be focused on uh, and opens up uh, fresh thinking to all of the work that we currently do in an enterprise. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this vision and, uh, and, I, I, and I share it with you. It's, I know you do. Uh, <laughs> le, le, <laughs> All the benefits we can we can get from from those technologies for the future of work, uh, and I really believe that it's helping. Uh, it will help uh, our world and our workplace to be more human. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 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 and uh, so I'm conscious of the time. Uh, I want I want this this uh, we want this video to be to be uh, to be uh, to be short in time, quite in, impactful for our audience. Um, last word from from you. How would you uh, end this 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 uh, this discussion? What what are the, the key key thoughts that come to you for for finalizing this? A um, couple of key thoughts. Um, one, um, pay attention. Pay really close attention. And what do I what do I mean by that? I mean actually start different information feeds. If you have a news feed, go in and learn about what's happening in quantum computing. Learn what's happening in 3D printing um, the, 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 or drones. The, each of these spaces is, is literally a, an industry 5.0 field itself and the explosive changes occurring there and the use cases of all of them are just extraordinary. So uh, there are there are mm, less than a dozen technologies that are are 5.0 technologies that are going to shape the next two decades, and they're each changing so fast that if you do not make a deliberate effort um, and go go seek the information, you will not believe how much changes each 12 months, and and I. I, I share this with you having been a student of this for five years, but through my affiliation with Abundance 360. Uh, and it really impressed on me the, the importance that I have to go in search of this information because it's advancing so fast 
that if I just stop watching it, if you didn't watch what happened to blockchain for 24 months in 2018 and 19, you wouldn't believe what happened from this, you know, arcane technology to all of a sudden, you know, the Bitcoin, you know, uh, millionaires. So I think that's probably number one. And, and the second uh, final thought I have for people is as you are thinking about innovating and reimagining um, the way work is done and what work is done, hold your constraints off in a separate pile. Put them over in a pile. You can bring them back in, but to free your thinking, um, don't allow your constraints to, uh, to, to kill the ideation that can come from tackling a problem with a clean sheet of paper when you have the tools that we have today. So those so, are my two, my two points. Yes, yes. So, so if I, so, uh, so your, your point is about, uh, don't, don't think about the constraints of current technologies, but yeah, think beyond and don't try to reproduce or imitate whatever is being done today and the way we do it today, but really think out of the box and, and recreate, redesign. Huh? Reimagine it. And, Reimagine. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's not just the constraints of the technology, but sometimes we think that we have an operational constraint uh, right. in our company. Oh, well, we have this regulation or we have that policy. Um, and we often use those as crutches to limit how much uh, free thinking we can do about how to reimagine that work. So, yeah, my suggestion is whether technology-based, cost-based, policy-based, regulation-based, whatever the, the source of those constraints might be, hold them at bay until you're done with your thinking about reimagining the work. Excellent. Thank you for those, those final words. Uh, Lee, it was really a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, an amazing discussion. Um, uh, uh, delightful vision of the future of work and, and industry 5.0. Um, thank you. Uh, to the audience, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lee. To the audience, if you want to follow Lee, um, uh, we'll flash on the screen how you can uh, connect with him. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the next five chat chats on the automation and the future of business. Thank you to the automation community. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you all.